Hello KZFR, how you guys doing tonight? This is Writing on Air. And Writing on Air is made possible by the generous contributions of KZFR supporters and by Andrew Sprague Construction, certified in pervious concrete for our green future and serving the North, uh, North State since 1983. Andrew Sprague Construction specializes in cultural structural concrete for commercial and residential construction, as well as hardscape, including stained or stamped concrete. Contact Andrew Sprague Construction by calling 877-7124. Well, my name is Kevin, and I am the one of the hosts of this show, and I have Kylie here with me. Hi, Kevin. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm doing really well. I'm excited for today. Yes, we actually have uh, some slightly different pieces in store. Um, usually, for the most part, at least for the past couple of weeks, we've had uh, poems. But tonight we have... Prose. Yes, <laughs> which is, if people don't know. Uh, prose is written as like just stories, fiction, nonfiction. Um, it looks like the work we have this evening is all fiction, which is really great. Yes, yes. So we'll get right into it because they're uh, kind of long. But before we do, actually, uh, if you want to submit, please submit at write.onair at gmail.com. That's W-R-I-T-E dot on air at gmail dot com. Yes. So please do submit. We need pieces. I mean, it keeps the show going, keeps us entertained and you entertained. So please, please do submit and, uh, and help make this show what it is. So uh, this first piece that we have is from a friend of mine. Um, it is a piece called The Drums, and it's written by Brandon Melrose. And this piece was uh, written, recorded, uh, read... And this, the music, I believe, was made and mixed by him all at the same time. So this is a pretty cool creative endeavor. Yes. Um, I think we would like to call this um, a performance piece. Yes. Yes. So he, he did this uh, at his home computer in Southern California, if I remember correctly, uh, on his headset. Um, so like legitimately, this is, this is like a workshop thing that he did all himself. So this should be pretty good. Um, and again, this is Brandon Melrose's uh, The Drums. Dented and battered, loose and torn leather straps. When will I no longer need this? When will I be able to leak this here? When will I be able to leave it here in this box? I must light the forms that I lift cold and take up a hammer that I thought I could discard. With a hot fire and a hammer, as heavy as the weight resting on my soul, I began my hated work. The hammer sang as it struck the steel, and as I began, so did the drums. Those hated drums. They began their rhythm, calling everyone to arms, and I began to fall into their time as I worked the hot steel. Repairing. Restoring. Regretting. I could see the dark stains left on parts of the leather. Those tar black marks that stared at me as I worked. Who was it? When was it? Too many times have I lit this forge. Too many times have I picked up this hammer. The drums were in the air again. The rhythm pulsed through the air as my hammer seemed with them, creating an unholy song to spare. Why? What other question could I ask? All the other ones were too much. Questions that I had asked too many times. How many of us would come back? How many will be crippled? Which of my friends will I bury? I wanted to push them away. They hung in the air, held there by the sound. The sword was already polished and sharpened. Its weight felt too heavy. Picking it up, I felt cold, even with the blazing forge in my back. Too many. Too many times. Too many scars. And far too many lives wasted. We will march in the morning, and I will no longer be a man. I will be a tool. An implement meant only to color the world a dark crimson. The drums have stopped, and so is my hammer. In their absence, the silence is deafening. I hang the hammer in its place, 
let the forge choke itself out. War is coming. When did I become this monster? Was it when they placed the sword in my hand for the first time? Could I have made a different choice then? So many questions hang heavy on my soul. So many regrets. But I must live with them. The bell begins to sound. Not the light, cheery tone that most bells make, but a deep, resonant tone that demands attention. I walk outside to see the muddy street with poorly kept wooden houses flanking either side. And I see the masses proceeding down the street towards the sloped red clay roof of the temple. It will soon be filled. Everyone gathering there at its call. Deeply, its voice reverberates in the streets. They will be told this is an endeavor worthy of our God, our Creator and Savior. They will be lied to, and they will believe it. What we are being asked to do is to commit murder. Even knowing the truth, I will still be a participant. My hands are already blackened and stained. I will march in the morning to the sound of those drums. They will fill the air, driving us forward, those horrible drums. We will stand in victory with fallen defeat, but the drums will fill the air. Sound mixing with the stench, blood, and sweat as men kill each other without knowing why. Who sounded the drums of war? Was it us? Was it them? It doesn't matter now and it's too late. My work now is done. That was Brandon Melrose, the drums. Sorry to be abrupt there at the end and <laughs> snuck up on us. We were reading along with it, so. That was cool. I got lost in that. Yeah, yeah. And he did such a good job of that. Um, this is really neat, like I said, because he did everything for this piece. I mean, everything was mixed by him, read by him, recorded by him, read, uh, written by him. Like, this is entirely his. So we were listening to it, and we had a, a couple things we wanted to pull out. Do you want to start? or? Uh, no, go for it, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I like this lot, one, because I identify with blacksmiths. Um, <laughs> I like blacksmithing, so when, when I first got this, I was pretty excited about it. But what we're kind of seeing in this piece, too, um, is obviously there's this blacksmith making tools for war, and he's sickened by it. He's questioning, like, what's going on? Like, man, this is just, I'm making these tools. And then eventually when I use them, I become the tool in this war. And he questions, um, I'm trying to see exactly where it is. There's a part in there where he questions, uh, what is war? Like, what's going on? Like, it's just, who's driving this? What's going on? There's these drums. There's this beat. There's this consistent thing that's moving forward. But who's beating them? We don't know. Who's, who's making us keep doing this, essentially? And there's that, like, chaotic confusion um, that's just really prevalent through this, this piece. I'm actually pretty curious to see, I believe this might be part of a bigger piece that he's working on, like a scene in it. And I'd love to read more of this. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I pulled out from that. Like just that consistent, the drums of war driving us forward and no one knows who's beating them. I like that too. Yeah. Um, I like this being a performance piece, especially knowing that, um, he was behind the music as well. Uh, it fit really well. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of this eerie feeling of war is imminent. It's coming. I'm a part of it. And I really just felt a part of this piece. Yeah. Um, it's really well done in the sense of uh, great imagery. Um, and I, I just imagine prepping for this war. And, and, and yeah. I've never been in war, but I can imagine hearing... The dr you know, drums from a distance coming at you, you know, like people always have the bagpipes. I was talking to my roommate about this <laughs> bagpipes making the sound in the distance in the fog. Um, and the point is that that influence of what, you know, we don't really know what's coming, but it sounds pretty ominous. And the same thing with these drums and war is ominous no matter what. And I just yeah. think he does such a great job. Lots of imagery, lots of that word cr crimson. Yes. That's one of my favorites. Um, I don't know, I've really blood. enjoyed uh, this. If Yeah, you know. and then to pull back to, uh, before we get into the next piece here, uh, just as a side note, we usually, um, we're, when we're recording the studio, we're, or we, when we are recording in the studio, we have to mix the sounds, the volumes, everything kind of going on, and this one was mixed wonderfully. 
and I really appreciate that. Like the his volume level was on tra- on on point. Basically, um, it was lower, so you could clearly hear what he was saying. He did a very good job of this, and like given even better equipment, it would only get better from there. Like it's, it's a really <laughs> good piece. So I'm I'm super excited about this because it's it's wonderful. So also keep that in mind. You can submit whatever you want. This was as just a suggestion. He asked if he could do it, and I said, yeah, you could do it. He submitted it, and that's it. So yeah. we, we're pretty open to things. Yeah, you know, that includes lyrics to mm. songs and songs themselves. Yes. Um, because, again, lyrics are still writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And r- lyrics are really, really hard. So, yeah, yeah if anything that you have out there where you're feeling really creative, please send it to us. We'd really love to either have you in the studio or to read your work and uh, listen to what you've got to give to us. So yeah. Thank you. So thanks, Brendan, for pioneering that. And uh, I think the next piece is... Uh, I think by an anonymous author. Correct. Um, it's titled Old Man Fletcher. Um, it's a pretty good piece. Uh, I think you guys are going to like it. So I'll go ahead and go in. The neighbors say that when Old Man Fletcher died, everything he touched died with him. Devil thistles choked out his carefully tended wildflowers. The tiny green fruits of the birdhouse gourds fell to the ground like ornaments on a discarded Christmas tree. The vegetables wilted, then turned brown, and the orchard fell silent. Neighborhood boys ran beside the white picket fence, dragging sticks across it until it could take no more abuse. One day it fell over in a blustery wind, crushing the remaining sunflowers and pinning their bright faces between the slats. The bristly leaves poked through, begging for freedom. At a quarter of noon, on a crisp fall day, Mrs. Flaherty went out to collect her mail and saw a woman in a shiny silver Lexus drive up to Fletcher's house. Mrs. Flaherty gasped, put a hand over her mouth and ran into the house to call Mrs. Drysdale. Soon phones all over town were ringing with the news. Did you hear? Maisie's come back home. Who does she think she is coming home now? She broke her daddy's heart. That's what she did. While the tongues wagged and fingers pointed, Maisley focused on the task she had come home to complete. She weeded, pruned, and raked until her fingers were blistered. Her long hair, now streaked with gray, fell into thick tangles that she didn't bother to comb out. In the evening, she swept, mopped, washed windows, and dusted. Early one morning, she sat on the back porch steps, looking out over the yard when she heard a noise. An egg flew past her and struck on a, struck a peach tree. She heard boys laughing and the sound of running feet slapping the sidewalk. She felt utterly exhausted. Her bottom lip began to tremble. Her eyes filled with tears and she collapsed into her her folded arms and sobbed. She cried for the years lost with her dad. She cried tears of guilt and anger, her body quivering with the emotion of it all. She thought about her dad. She had wanted more for her life, but he argued with her saying everything she needed was here. He could not understand her need for freedom. She shunned her modeling career, calling it a useless... He shunned her modeling career, calling it a useless trade. Years later, she became co-owner of a pricey boutique and came home to share her good news. Of course, Fletcher hadn't seen or heard from her in ages, so when she showed up in a fancy new car and an expensive wardrobe, he refused to talk to her. She reasoned with him, and begged him to listen, but he wanted no part of this city girl. He wanted his little Maisley back, the girl that used to chase butterflies and eat fresh tomatoes off the vine and fix him jelly toast in the mornings. She vowed never to return. Until now. Wiping her face, she got up and hauled the trash bags to the dumpster, kicked dirt over the broken eggshells, and set out to prune the fruit trees. That was Old Man Fletcher by an anonymous uh, author. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anonymous, please give us a name because <laughs> there is so much about this. I might be your new fan, your new, your new <laughs> best fan. Um, I love this idea of a, um, a girl coming back to kind of make amend to um, a father who, I mean, obviously has passed away. And uh, this, this main character, Maisley, tries to say, you know, Dad, I still love you. And I've always tried to make you proud, but I didn't. And you can tell that 
you know, based on how he was. He was a man of the earth and, Mm -hmm. you know, those worldly uh, possessions and stuff is not, you know, just, I I think he, as the father, we can just assume based on this, that it was not what he wanted for his daughter. He wanted her to have the sweet simplicity of the life that he had where, you know, she could pick the, the tomatoes off the vine and enjoy uh, what earth offers. And the, this writer is phenomenal in the imagery. Uh, even the dialogue I thought was actually really, <laughs> really cool. Mm. Um, you know, that's what she did. There's just this, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, sometimes dialogue's easy to hear in your head, but hard to say out loud, but they do just a really good job here. Yeah. Um, really overall, I really appreciated, and this is what we would prob- we would call flash fiction. It kind of has a beginning, middle, and end, uh, and gives us just enough for us to make uh, a, a certain type of uh, structure. Yes, it's, yeah. it's really good. I, I liked this. This is great. I really enjoyed it too because there was like, <clears throat> to me, it felt like there was some distinct parts to it, almost in like broken up into pieces. There was the beginning that kind of set up what's going on, um, what this, who this old man was when he died, stuff like that. Um, and then, then it transferred, uh, trans, yeah, transferred over to the daughter who needed that sense of freedom, went out, explored the world and then came back. And while that, how it was happening. So like the physical transition was happening, going away, realizing they want to come back and coming back. There was also the emotional one happening at the exact same time. Emotionally, she didn't want to be there. And there was the regret that came back, which we see when, when she collapsed into her folded arms and sobbed, it all just kind of bubbled out. There was that next step. And then there was that almost acceptance of what was going on now and coming back to her roots at the very end. Wiping her face, she got up and hauled the trash bags to the dumpster, kicked the dirt over broken eggshells, and set out to prune the fruit trees. It's like a, it's a resolve at the end there. And man, that is so, so beautiful. It's just, it's really succinct. It's, it's a, it's, this is a gem to me. <laughs> yeah, I really liked a lot of the pieces that felt somewhat relatable. Um, maybe in my childhood, simple things like I like the... Fix him jelly toast in the mornings. Yeah. Something about jelly toast. Like it could have said, there, there are so many different ways you could have written that. Um, and I love the way the author went about just the language in this to me was absolutely fantastic. And I'm a huge, like <laughs> as a creative writer, like in, in prose, this kind of stuff really does. Uh, you can really appreciate this type of talent. So I'm, I'm very glad that she, she shared this with us or she, yeah. I don't know who it is. I say she, I, <laughs> yeah, she is the main, the, the main character. Yeah. I apologize for that. But the, whoever this author is, whoever shared it with us, I do appreciate um, mm-hmm. the talent. So thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, we will come back to these at the end, I'm sure, but I think we have another piece lined up. <laughs> yes. Um, actually this is my piece. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, I will be reading this at the symposium. Uh, at Chico State, it's the uh, uh, HFA, Humanity and Fine Arts Symposium. Oh, yeah, right, so coming up here in April. Um, so this particular story, um, I'm just going to read the ending of it. Mm. Um, and uh, again, it is fiction. It is not about me, <laughs> even <laughs> though the main character says I. Um, <clears throat> the idea is this, uh, this particular main character, she's uh, going to Arizona from uh, uh, Malibu to uh, clean out her father's stuff. He is an alcoholic and has a drinking problem. He went to Arizona to isolate and he pretty much died because of his disease. Mm. Um, and she herself is also an alcoholic. So she has a bit of a struggle as she goes down there to clean out his stuff, uh, of which her brothers didn't want to do. And she kind of understands why. Yes. And then just to be clear, this is the tail end of that story. This right? is the very ending of okay. the story. So kind of a prelude. And as she's cleaning out, she stumbles upon the suitcase And the suitcase uh, she always remembers as a child. And there's this one part where it says, I remembered my father's hand on the handle, white knuckled and shaking. I think back now on my days of drinking. And I recall when I shook like that in the morning, it was a subtle yet distinctive shake of needing another drink. And so she's kind of going on about what this suitcase means to her. And it seems to be a trigger. Okay. All right. Well, then uh, let's get right into it. I reached out for the suitcase and pulled it closer. Everything came back in that moment. I closed my eyes and squeezed the suitcase as hard as I could as emotion surged through me and a sob escaped my lips. A sob and then a demonic burst of anger and I stood up, getting entangled in the clothes hanging on the wooden rod, a muffled jangling sound as hangers wrapped around each other. I let out a primal scream, trying to burst out of my skin and from the gut. 
the clothes, smothering me. I threw the suitcase across the room as hard as I could, eyes still closed as if to take me out of the room. I screamed and I screamed and I screamed until I wanted to throw up and my voice gave out. I ran, the I ran to the suitcase across the room, picked it up by the handle, and beat it against the wall, praying for it to break apart and take all my emotions with it. With a final bellowing, dang it, I gave the suitcase one last chuck across the room and it hit the door frame of the closet and broke open. I slid my back against the wall and was now dented with crumbling paint and small pieces of the corners of the suitcase. I learned in AA that it's okay to feel emotions, but this was different. These weren't emotions. It was something bigger, tangible, pulsing through my butt blood and leaving a taste in my mouth. Memories flooded in and I decided to let them take over because I didn't know what else to do. I began to understand why my brothers didn't want to come down here. I could smell my father in the room and I felt suffocated. I took a moment before deciding to get up when I looked over at the suitcase broken open and a pile of shirts. I crawled towards it and saw something terribly familiar laying sprawled out as if waiting to be found after all this time. A bottle of gin. I sat back on my knees and ran my hand over my face and through my hair with an exasperated sigh. Of course there would be a bottle of gin in the suitcase, I said to myself with an annoyed laugh. The heck, I said as I reached over and grabbed it. The glass was cool to my touch despite the heat of the room. I held it for a long time, staring blankly. I smelled the bottle, the soft scent of pine, the almost sweet aroma. I hadn't had a drink since the first since I first stepped into the halls of AA eight years ago. I imagined the gin slowly rolling on my tongue smoothly, easing me with its warm comfort in my chest. I held the bottle close, closing my eyes tight, fighting back tears of frustration. I sighed and softened my grip, slowly I looked down and loosened the top and smelled it closely. It felt good. The smell felt so good. I tightened the lid, put it back in the suitcase, and then put the suitcase back together. I finished going through my father's things, taking a few old Hawaiian button-up shirts and some old vintage pants of his. I wasn't sure what to do with them, and the smell of them angered me, but something compelled me to take them. I grabbed the suitcase, the key, the yellow ship slip of paper, and left the mobile home with the soft click of the key, locking the simple brass knob. I walked to my car. The sound of my new boots on the gravel echoed in the otherwise silent air. I put the suitcase in the passenger seat, climbed in the car, and when the radio came on as I the radio came on as I turned the ignition, I shut it off with a click. I waited a moment, looking at the sunset behind my father's home. Deep pink, purple, blue, and orange framed the dingy white mobile home, making it seem like something pleasant, a place you might want to go. I pulled out of the driveway and onto the road to head home. I watched the trailer and the sunset fade away in the rear view mirror. I looked at the suitcase next to me and opened it. I sat the bottle up on top of the clothes as if it were a person, reaching over and pulling the seatbelt out while using my knee to steer. I buckled in the bottle and the suitcase full of my father's clothes. We're going home, Dad, I said, reaching for the radio but pausing for a moment. I pulled away and leaned back. I let the silence do the talking as I pressed the gas to merge onto the highway. Oh, that was a beautiful piece. <laughs> <laughs> I got nervous reading, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> it's hard when you read your own work. It's much easier to read other people's. Yes, yeah, yes. So. But yeah, that was... Uh, it, actually, I apologize, I forgot to name the title of it. It's called A Yellow Slip of Paper to Arizona. Mm. And so the main character gets a letter, uh, a little piece of paper and a key mailed to her. And that's how she goes down to Ugh. open up the mobile home and rummage through it. Man, I like it. It is at the end there. There's that acceptance of just like of the father figure almost and just like, you know what? This is it. Like, let's go home. There's that acceptance of the self too. And man, that's just, that's a very potent piece. Thank All the you. things to it. It's just kind of sitting there. There's, it almost feels dry until the very end as well, mm -hmm. which is interesting because gin is dry and stuff like that. But, <laughs> um, so I'm told that, uh, <laughs> uh, there's this like kind of like drought aspect to it. Like there's nothing there. And then when the love is kind of found and the love is kind of regained at the end, that's when she accepts that like, um, uh, well, I was going to say like the, the water of life, but it's gin. So it's not really <laughs> that, but, but, um, 
essentially she takes it inside of her. She becomes whole at the end. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know what, this is what it is. This is where we're going forward and let's go home. Yeah, it's really tough because this is like, like the piece actually at this point is the crescendo gets to the very top and it's a very, uh, it's the point where in the end, you know, it, everything yeah. kind of comes to a head. It's the trigger and that's where she kind of loses it. And it's kind of hard to read that without reading the whole thing. And yes. yeah, I don't want to waste my whole, this whole <laughs> right, right. show just on my piece. So um, ironically enough, it's funny because I wrote that very end. I had to write it a couple of times and I was like, man, you know, what a weird thing to do to buckle up some bottle and say, hey, you know, hey, dad, we're going home. And then after reading it a couple of times, I realized I did the same exact thing after my mother died, I was given her ashes and I was driving, you know, back down south to mm. Southern California where I used to live <laughs> and I buckled her in. You're still a person. Yeah, it was so bizarre. And it, I didn't realize I had done that in reading this. And that's what's kind of crazy about fiction and prose. Sometimes, pops you know, we come out <laughs> without realizing it. I was like, what a weird thing to do. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I did that exact thing. <laughs> um, also, it's hard to read this because there are curse words in it. We are not oh. allowed to curse online. So <laughs> some of those I kind of had to catch myself. So forgive me. It on... was very smooth. I didn't notice. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, um, yeah, I think we, I think I would like to say as if I'm, if we're going to put these all together, yeah, I'm yeah. seeing a theme mm. of personal journeys and I, I didn't realize in bringing mine that it was, again, we read these cold, um, and reading anonymous is, was that same journey of a daughter and a mm. father and what, you know, what these characters do to appease either that father figure that's such a crazy like how do we react to death and the morning in this particular my particular piece as compared to the anonymous piece very very similar doing things that you know it seems like the characters would normally not do but death brings out something in them yes and even like i'll add on to that too because like pulling in brandon's piece mm -hmm. um kind of this this question of what's going on around them and then almost an acceptance of it so they see that there's death in, in the anonymous in your piece. Um, there's this like, obviously there is a death. There's a death of two fathers. And there's the acceptance of, well, this is how it was, but I'm going to continue moving forward in this direction with with what it is. This is reality. And then in Brandon's piece, it's the same thing. He's mm -hmm. questioning like, I'm doing these same things. I'm making these tools of war and I know I'm going to become one, but what can we do? We just have to keep moving forward. Yeah, that sound of drums, you could apply to like all yes. of these, that constant motion. Like we you know, we read in these that these characters just keep going, you know, yeah. in uh, Old Man Fletcher, the daughter just keeps going. She keeps tending to the farms. Same with, you know, this piece, uh, the yellow slip of paper, still continuing to go through, like, even though it's not necessarily what these characters want to do, they do it anyway, because they know that's what they have. That's their purpose currently. Yeah, it's perfect. Because at the very end of Anonymous, it's like wiping her face. She got up and hauled the trash bags to the dumpster kick the dirt over and, and uh, set out to prune the fruit trees. She's moving forward. She's accepted it, moved forward. And then in yours, she buckles up the suitcase next to her and says, all right, let's go home. And then in Brandon's, it says, who sounded the drums of war? Was it us? Was it them? It doesn't matter now. It's too late. My work's done. So let's just wait. Like, we got to keep going. Yeah. It's just a consistent thing. Like, that's really actually, I didn't, I did not see that before we looked at this. But <laughs> the last lines of all of these really are hitting on the same vein, I would say. Just like yeah. time moves in one direction we've done things, things have happened, we've missed things yeah. and things that we regret and that we wish we could have done differently, but we have to keep going forward. Yeah. It's such a cool piece. Oh, I mean, all this stuff. Really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, and I promise everyone out there, we, we try to read these as cold as we can. We don't like to plan a whole bunch in, in beforehand or before the show, because I feel it's not as, in my opinion, it's not as genuine. It, it when it first strikes you, we're getting the same kind of read through as you guys are as listening. Correct. So we get to be part of the audience when, when this is happening and that's that's the most enjoyable to me at least i can i can't speak i totally you know. agree to that because then we this is as a, as a as a writer myself when somebody were to read my work i would want them to read it what is that first impression you're getting without having to go back and reread yeah. and that's what i love about these is i get to see in reading other people's work their reaction and now i kind of would guess how it is for me so i yeah. i really do appreciate everyone who's submitted so yeah keep yeah. doing it Oh, please do. And speaking of submissions, uh, if you want to submit, you can submit at write.onair at gmail.com. And please do, because we need more submissions. Uh, if you want to have some creative stuff on here and you want to run something by us, it's totally fine. It's perfect. I mean, we, we're pretty open. You can email us again at write.onair at gmail.com. That's W-R-I-T-E dot on air at gmail.com. And we love creativity. So go for it. Yes. We're open for everything right now. 
And please don't forget that Writing on Air is made possible by the generous contributions of KZFR supporters and by Harrison Daily Wright Accountancy Corporation in Chico. Harrison Daily Wright provides certified public accountants specializing in accounting and bookkeeping services, auditing, tax prep and planning, management support, services for nonprofit organizations, and more. To reach Harrison Daily Wright, call 895-1209. And again, my name is Kevin, and this is... I'm Kyleen. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.